record. <laughs> All right, now we're officially on the record since we got the other out. We have two doctors with us here today on today's healthcare scene lab. <laughs> no, uh, we have Dr. Uh, James Legan, better known as Jimmy Vanagan, <laughs> and Ryan Gray, uh, who has a medical podcast as well. So, anyways, Ryan was just saying that uh, before we went on the record that we have that he did his first blab a couple of days ago. So, what are your thoughts on it versus podcasting versus other social media? Oh, it doesn't even compare to podcasting. It's it's just podcasting is is a one way street uh, of communication, but Blab uh, allowed me to jump on. I think at, uh, I had eleven people on, maybe at at the most at one time. Had all four seats filled, and maybe forty or fifty people total that had come in to watch, and, and it was just a great conversation. You you get your community involved and and have them discuss with you whatever whatever's on their mind, and it's just a great way to to reach out and touch them. Interesting. It looks like you have to leave a seat open to get someone else to chime in. Is that right? There's yeah. Like so, so you as the kind of the, the leader here can, can boot people um, <laughs> or, or, or the, the, I guess the, the proper blab etiquette is as soon as you're done talking, you kind of leave the seat so somebody else can come in. Right. So yeah, I just kicked Chuck out since his video and audio wasn't working anyways, but uh you can lock someone in too, which I thought was interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's good. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's, comparing it to Periscope, uh, Periscope's fun because it, it's really interactive. You, you know, people get there quickly, uh, you know, and they've built up a good following. So I think you get a lot of followers immediately. Uh, if you don't have a following on Blab, you're not going to get as many people to join it unless you're talking social media content marketing or... <laughs> <laughs> something yeah. uh you know it seems like all the social media content marketers have hopped on it but you know when you start talking you know like in this case i put healthcare you're not going to get as many casual viewers joining it as much as you might on periscope so, yeah ca casual viewers know it's it's your community whatever your community is so i i put it out um when i had my first blab a couple days ago i sent out a, an email to my list um, I put it on Facebook in my private group. So that's, that's where the people found me. So did you schedule the blab and say, I'm going to be on there or did you just send it immediately and hope for some immediate reaction? I sent it like a half an hour before. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, we've talked about that with Periscope too. It's like, should we schedule the Periscopes or should it be more of this live kind of, <laughs> you know, interactive and kind of in the moment thing, uh, which on Periscope, you know, partially I didn't want to commit to a full schedule of, okay, I'm going to be here at this time every week or whatever. Uh, but on Blab, it feels like maybe I would. Kind yeah. Of like with Hangouts. I, I, again, I think it goes back to your community, what they want, what they like. Yeah, for sure. And now what's interesting is I've actually been thinking about doing a lot of the Hangouts and converting them into podcasts. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, depend, if you structure it the right way, then, yeah, I think you could do the same with blab, I assume. Uh, although that's, I that's actually how I used my blab. Uh, I turned it into the, this week's podcast, um, just to see how it would go. Uh, nice. it, it was kind of loud and distracting and very different from my normal podcasts because people are calling in on their phones from God knows where. Uh, so it's, it's probably for somebody who's just finding my podcast and that's the first one they listen to, they might be a little turned off, but uh, I, I think it's interesting. I, I thought there were enough gold nuggets that came out of it to, to turn it into a podcast. And it probably depends on how many people you include, right? I mean, uh, is it more, you could use Blab as just a two or three person uh, mm -hmm. conversation, which makes for a nice podcast. But if you, you know, start adding, you know, all the outside viewers, then it changes the experience, right? Correct. Yeah. So, so you could, I, I could do my normal interview format podcast, which is me and somebody else or, or me and, and two other people um, and not invite anybody else into the seat, but have other people watch and listen and, um, and kind of hang out and ask questions through the chat function and turn that into a podcast. That's definitely a, a valuable uh, alternative. And, and the audio quality on Blab seems to be pretty good um, to, as an alternative to Skype or whatever uh, other means people use. That's good. Cause I was going to say quality is a major issue. Uh, I've thought about doing it just through Uber conference, which is 
a conference system, you know, everyone can call in and just recording the podcast that way. Um, yeah. All about convenience, right? <laughs> yeah. I use Skype. I've never had any issues with Skype uh, call quality. Right. The quality on this end is really quite good. I'm at the office and, and we've got, we actually use a licensed microwave for our internet provider, 3030. So the, uh, the audio and, uh, and video quite acceptable on the Chromebook on my end. So I'm, I'm, I'm impressed so far with the few minutes I've been on. Yeah. And what, what I've found is, so, so I'm just using a, a Logitech webcam. Uh, when people come in on their phone through the app their their picture quality is much better the the video quality so i don't know if blab is just limiting um quality through the computer but when you use it through the app it's crystal clear so if you use an ipad or iphone app i think it's just iphone right now right Um, i don't know I, i think so i think it's only ios uh but if you use that you're saying the picture quality is much better than desktop Interesting. And uh, Niguru, which I think is surely right, she said that uh, the host will get the audio recorded and sent to her. So that's pretty cool. Will it send the video as well after you finish a blab or yeah. is it just the audio? It does video as well. I did read that it will archive this forever. So now <laughs> the will be archived in perpetuity. <laughs> there, maybe there's a delete function. Who knows? <laughs> But uh, yeah, the, you know, unlike Periscope, which lasts the 24 hours, unless you capture, capture it yourself, then it's there. So. And then there's Catch. I haven't used Catch with Periscope, um, but I think that'll capture either YouTube it or Catch, my, it, it, you know, is my understanding in, it, in order to catch the Periscope. Yeah, I think it does catch it to uh, catch the servers. I don't know if they've created a download function or not. But uh, it kind of makes it interesting. If you think about Catch's business model, if they capture all the periscopes, you can go watch any periscope you want at any time. That's a pretty smart, smart way to do it. You get all these content producers for free. <laughs> you essentially create a YouTube of periscope videos, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. so, interesting. Yeah, I mean, I guess it goes back for me is this live interaction is a thousand times better than trying to sit there and talk to yourself. Uh, and hope that some people will leave some comments and th- like uh, like James said earlier, you know, the comments feel late uh, on Periscope, whereas this feels much more real time. So uh, interesting. Yeah, I've actually, uh, I haven't done any Periscoping. Oh, really? Yeah. You got to get on it. <laughs> Don't start. You'll be addicted. Uh, yeah, well, why Periscope? And I can blab. This, uh, I think this is better. <laughs> Well, well, I think Periscope's a lot of fun, kind of like what John, John just went to Dubai and uh, he scoped there a few times. But, it, you know, if you live in an interesting area like Chuck, who was trying to join us early, he lives in D.C. and he'll study up the history and, and he scopes and he's he was going from a handful of followers. He's got over 500 followers every time he scopes. So I think what's interesting about scope versus this is that you can take your phone with you and scope interesting. I, I live in Montana and there's several folks. I did some scopes early on on a combine folks, you know, in a lot of part of the country, they've never been on a combine tractor, that sort of thing in big wheat fields uh, during the harvest. So a lot of folks found that fascinating. And then some of the history around Montana. So I think Periscope has its kind of unique uh, uh, niche there. And then the other thing is, you know, I'm a small uh, time internist here in Great Falls, Montana, small town of about 50,000 and trying to push some of my ideas that I've found rather successful here in the office uh, with regular channels. You just can't get much airtime where what Periscope allowed me to do, like last week, John and I had a wonderful John Chuck and I and some other folks had a wonderful conversation where I scoped and, and involved them. But I like the feel of this a little better for those kinds of things. I think for educational uh, exchange of ideas, I can see where this could be a little better or, more, you know, just a little better uh, medium to work with just from, from my gut feeling for the first little, you know, little time I've been on here. Yeah. Yeah. And our, our Periscope, right? I mean, all those questions that I was asking you through Periscope, which was kind of a pain in the butt, although I don't know if I would have been able to hop on Blab because I was in the airport in San Francisco when we were doing that. So uh you know, it, it, you know, all of those questions would have been much better in a blab. I would have been able to ask them much easier, especially on my side of things, you know. I agree. I really hard to ask it. <laughs> yeah, I agree. So, yeah, interesting. 
But yeah, the other thing, I mean, you know, right now we have about 10 viewers. We've got 18 viewers overall. Periscope has a bigger following right now. Will that evolve in Blab? But, you know, it'd be interesting to see. So <clears throat> I guess for me, you know, as I look at all of these, it's, it's just the evolution of live video streaming and audio streaming and interaction with other people. So, it, you know, uh, I, I think... Um, uh, what, what's his name? Uh, I just, Chris Brogan. He he did one, and he said he said it the right way. I think he said, "Get on, capture as many users as you can, convert them to your other stuff, because who knows how long it will be around." You know, uh, Google <laughs> Hangouts may be gone. Uh, <laughs> Blab may be gone. Uh, you know, UStream is gone. Or Justin TV is gone. UStream has converted into other things. You know, they're they're all part of that evolution of video. Uh, and so, you know, I think we'll always have this opportunity and, and people will want to connect with each other. People will want to share content. It's just going to, you know, the form might change. It might not be called blab, you know, one day it will be called, uh, you know, boob or something, <laughs> you know, uh, maybe not that, no, that's a porno version one, I guess, but, <laughs> you know, it'll, it'll just evolve. Uh, but we, you know, the one thing about all social media is that we all want great information. And we all have this insatiable need to connect and share. So I think those are the core principles that will happen in every one of these uh, platforms. Yeah, I agree. Yep, definitely. I, I, I kind of like a little bit of Civil War history, and I think a lot of it's like timing. And uh, the conversation that I, uh, between uh, Sherman and uh, Grant, whenever Grant went down below Vicksburg, Right before the siege, Sherman had said to Grant and reading Grant's memoirs, uh, basically said, are you crazy? The enemy would love to have us in this position. And Grant said it's all about timing. And he knew the, uh, you know, he knew the uh, personalities of the two generals that he was going against uh, when he went uh, to go after Vicksburg. But I think in terms of what you were saying, John, in terms of social media, I think I think it's a lot about timing and hitting it right. And then, you know, in six months from now, uh, this may not be the appropriate form to be on to do these kinds of things. But I think I think you're absolutely right about the timing. So let me ask you this. I mean, just so we actually at least do the title justice. How do you think this will be used in healthcare? Uh, you know, I mean, uh, James, you talked about, you know, using it to share some of your ideas in your practice. Uh, what, what other ways do you think it will be used? Um, I, I think, as Ryan indicated, I think with with the following that, uh, you know, one can generate with social media, I, you know, I'm I'm a rather new uh, a bit of a newbie when it comes to social media. I didn't even start Twitter until about a year ago. And uh, my uh, then, you know, I've got a 15 and a 12 year old and my 15 year old thought I was crazy. And my perception of Twitter has at the time when I started, I, I had really uh, no idea what it was all about. But it's been a great uh, forum for education. I think Twitter can be the backbone for these kind of new evolving um, uh mediums to integrate with your following. So I see Periscope having a niche. I think Blab will have a niche, but I think the the backbone that one can have with Twitter is, you know, you can blog from there. If you, you know, if you have photographs, that sort of thing, you can uh, have a, have almost like a uh, area, like your nest can be the Twitter area. And then you can have extensions of yourself with your followers in these different mediums. So that's how I see it playing out. So whether you are doing something uh, kind of for fun for your followers, doing things interesting around the area in which you live or medical education where you can hop on and you you can have, I think, various themes uh, with what you are trying to do, whether it be fun related or work related and maybe have different um, portions of your following that will respond to both. So I think having Twitter, you can really develop a, a, a multifaceted following and then you can appease or, um, or uh, you know, uh, connect with your different facets of who choose to follow you. It's how I see Blab and Periscope uh, with Twitter. But, you know, that's my perception. So. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting to think that, uh, you know, if it weren't for Twitter, Facebook, et cetera, a lot of these platforms wouldn't exist because you'd hop on there and no one would know to join. So now that we have followings on Twitter, on Facebook, on, on social media, email lists, 
we have a simple way to invite them to join us. And so then it's actually interesting. If there wasn't that way, you know, none of it would work. So I wonder how many have maybe tried this before, but it was pre-Twitter, pre-social media. So there wasn't the, you know, because it's not fun to hop on something. And then, you know, this wouldn't be fun if you two didn't join, right? And I'm sitting here talking. Yeah, Uh, (laughs) absolutely. Depends on your personality. (laughs) Well, then it becomes a straight podcast, right? Uh, you know, which is yeah. fine. You can enjoy that too. But, uh, it, you know, especially the in- spontaneous uh, meetups that uh, are happening so much on these, they wouldn't happen without the. So interesting. Yeah. That, you know, my, my response to how, or how, or how is healthcare going to use it is I don't think it's any different than what people were doing on Google Plus Hangouts and what some people have been started doing on Periscope. I think it's going to be very similar. We're going to see live stream video from surgeries, operations. We're going to see medical, medical education stuff. I'll be streaming on here. Uh, you know, all of those things that we saw on Google Plus Hangout. I mean, I remember when I saw literally live streamed at a conference, a doctor doing, a, I think it was a hernia operation or something like that. And I mean, we were watching, you know, I think it was with Google Glass as well, uh, you know, wearing it so we could watch the operation. I think there's, you know, massive things that can be done with medical education. Um, Let's see, there was a comment from M. Diner. He said that he's using it as an extension to their social media communication, primarily building credibility and trust with your, your audiences, with, with his audiences, uh, which, I, you know, obviously that's a huge thing. That's kind of the other side. I mean, I think there's healthcare in general. And then the other side is how do you market healthcare products to doctors, hospitals, and, and build credibility that way? And I, I think these blabs could be a great way to do that. Uh, mm-hmm. from a marketing perspective. And of course, this comes from the guy who organized the health IT marketing and PR conference. So uh, I think it will be a major discussion at this next year's conference about what are these live video platforms and how can they be used in healthcare? Yeah. What do you think, Ryan? Why, you why even have a conference anymore? Everybody just jumps on Blab. <laughs> save the airfare. The, the, save the, save the carbon the emissions airplane. from the airplanes. On, on Blab, you can't dance with the other person. And <laughs> That's true. <laughs> you know plus you know you have the side conversations and a few other things like that but you're oh, right yeah. actually i think next week uh let me look at my calendar but uh chuck and i who had joined and also dr nick and uh, colin uh hung from uh stericycle we're actually joining in on the first international medical conference being done on google plus hangouts so all of the sessions are done on Google Plus Hangouts, and uh, we're doing a session. It looks like it's 9.30 on Thursday, uh, so I'm sure we'll be tweeting out the link and everything. But uh, like you said, why have a conference? We can just do it all online. It's, it's organized by a guy out of Spain, which is interesting as well. Uh, we're going to be talking healthcare IT, and I think we're actually talking about patient engagement. So you know, some of this discussion will likely come up there as well. So. Yeah, it's huge. Yeah, send a send a link to that if you if you have one just to the general that conference. Uh, I need to find. Uh, <laughs> we've had so many emails with uh, links planning the thing, as you can imagine, like any conference. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, I should put it on my events page as well. That'd be good. <laughs> but it's definitely changing things, right? So. At yeah, Twitter says, Vumedi is a portal for doctors where they have all manner of video, pre-recorded live webinars, mashups, slides, and talking head, plus a huge community. Have to be a medic to join. Hmm. So it sounds like a sermo, but with video. <laughs> Interesting. Have either of you guys participated in that? No, first I have it. not. Do you guys participate on sermo? Do you know what sermo is? I know I what sermo is. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I know what Sermo is, but I don't I don't participate in that. I don't I don't either. So this is actually the real challenge. I'd love to hear since you're both MDs, right? How do we? How many MDs really consume all of this? You know, not many. How many participate in social media, and how many are so busy with their practice when they go home, all they want to do is have a glass of wine and spend time with their family, or. Wow. Yeah, you know, and you're absolutely right. I think a few years ago, I wouldn't even think or even have time to do this. I'm, you know, I'm at the point of my career where I'm kind of on the downhill phase. You know, I got probably another 10 years left in me. But, uh, you know, I think what social media for me and I think 
as time goes on, as there are more young physicians involved in social media, I think we'll see a higher percentage of folks over time uh, as we older folks tend to go out to pasture. But uh, but I think um, what social media has been just a, a bonus for me is uh, really being able to connect, <clears throat> like you said, John, and uh, being able to share uh, things that have worked that, you know, it's almost like I've been in a little laboratory here in a small town in Great Falls, and I've had to kind of piece together some things that, uh, you know, after three, four years into this uh, transition from the paper world to the electronic world, like I talked about last week, um, you know, I hear where we have problems with interoperability and patient engagement and all those kinds of things. But uh, the truth of the matter is that in a small office practice, there are some really incredible applications out there that can make your life better. And then um, and that's all I have wanted to do, really. And that's the reason I got involved with Twitter is to share some of these things that work. And it's my way of I, I feel it's my way of giving back to the profession. You know, I, I'm, it's one of those things that if I can help a few people along the way, that's good. So that's, that's how I kind of uh, see social media in, in, from my perspective in the. Yes. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, I, you know, I talk to a lot of doctors and I think that some of them, you know, so no doubt they're doing searches online and reading blogs and reading different, you know, content that's done. You know, they might listen to a podcast, they might watch a video if it's a topic they want, but they probably find it more often through Google than they do uh, through anything else. And then they may subscribe from there to specific ones. But, uh, you know, I, I don't think they're really exploring it. You, know, you almost described it like charity work, you know, like, hey, I'm giving back to the profession as opposed to yeah. this for my professional development. I need this to be a doctor. You know, which is, you know, I wonder if that, like you said, with the younger doctors, will they start seeing it that way? If I want to be able to run a practice, I to do it. One, because I need to get new patients. Uh, so there's you know, the marketing aspect, aspect of it. Uh, but the second one is, uh, do I need that to be able to stay up on the latest happenings in medicine? And if I mm -hmm. don't, will I miss out on those learnings? Whereas before, what would you do? Subscribe to the journals and, and things like that. Yes. And then up to date's yeah. a wonderful resource too. That's just been yeah. a godsend for for you know staying up on things. Uh, up to date is one of those things that I don't know if you guys have heard the term just in time learning. Uh, up to date is just in time learning, where journals are kind of an archaic way of dispensing information. And and from everybody that I've talked to, nobody reads them. They just gather dust. And, and I get mad every time a journal comes in the mail because it, it typically just goes straight into the recycling bin. So the uh, journals do or the up-to-date does The it? journal does. Journal, yeah. Well, and then the I, tell my yeah, I tell my patients I don't even look at medical books anymore because by the time it gets printed, it's out of date. And, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, up-to-date is just a wonderful, fluid uh, medium that works extremely well. Wonderful patient information, too, that's just – uh, and you can get CME credit too, so it really kills three birds with one stone. So, yeah. How do you guys consume up to date? Uh, I've seen it with the HR or some of that stuff. How do you guys consume up to date through? Is there is there an app? Is that where you do it? Integrated right in the EHR is the best way. And then I've got laser printers in each exam room, and then I can print the information right to the patient portal or to paper. And uh, it and and with the uh, large 24 inch video uh, screen that I share with the patient, I can share all that in real time visually as well. So. Uh, the up-to-date in that type of a uh, scenario works extremely well and my patients like it and then you give them a you know a handout that they can look at and read about later and it really connects things quite nicely interesting so coco internal mad uh, she says anybody planning to be in berlin next week for the ifa uh, digital health startup i just got back from uh, dubai so i'm done traveling for the half of I I, uh, I did tweet out um, a periscope from Sasha Pallenberg. He's there right now. And uh, if you go to uh, uh, my uh, Jimmy Underline Vanigan or go to Sasha Pallenberg, he's right there right now and he's tweeting some stuff out. He actually had an interesting uh, link on Twitter about the new Chromebook that's coming out in October and they actually showed it, but everything was in German. So I couldn't understand it, but I but it had a nice video demonstrating the new Chromebook, uh, uh, touchscreen Chromebook. 
<laughs> I love my Chromebook too. Well, we should welcome Michael here. Welcome. How are you doing, Michael? I'm doing well. How's everybody else doing? Good. Thank you. Good. It's our, right, thanks. It's our thanks Blab Virgin me. journey. We have Ryan here navigating us because it's his second. So he's the, he's the uh, <laughs> expert here. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the veteran here. <laughs> okay. Well, I appreciate you letting me just kind of uh, jump in here. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you were asking a question about Doximity. Uh, I, you know, they've done really well with their marketing and aggregating. You know, the story behind Doximity is they started the same founders as Hippocrates. So they've used some of the same uh, knowledge there to build it. Uh, I don't use it, uh, but I, you know, I'm not a doctor, so uh, full disclosure there. But, you know, certainly they've gotten a lot of market share and it's made sense for a lot of doctors to participate because they're actually paying them money for their advice. So I think they use right. it for that. I don't know. And I think they use it for some complicated cases as well. I think that's been uh, one of their most used features as well as, you know, if you have a complicated case, you post it and get feedback from your peers. Uh, how about you guys? Have you used Doximity? Nope. Not much. Not much. I get, you know, I get uh, uh, stuff in my inbox on my, uh, uh, on my email, uh, but I haven't really done much at all with, with that. I appreciate it. Well, one of the reasons I ask is uh, in my role, um, I'm not a doctor either, but I, uh, I work at a medical university and I work in a marketing department as a communication strategist and I manage the social media channels. And then we are also introducing, uh, we've been using uh, Meerkat for a little bit mm -hmm. uh, with reaching uh, patients and those kind of things and more of those kind of communications. But Doximity is something really important. We're trying to maybe push to our docs because the U.S. News and World Report um, best hospitals and best doctors uses Doximity very heavily for that purpose. Um, so our rankings could potentially go up in U.S. News and World Reports and best hospitals the more <laughs> our physicians get involved in it. So I'm just kind of wondering how many other physicians are out there. Yeah, and, and, and I come from the standpoint of I wish U.S. News and World Reports would fall off a cliff and die because it's such yep. a waste. Yeah. The metrics that they use to rank is, is just, it's so subjective that it's ridiculous. Yeah, and to the consumers and the research that I've been doing, uh, they don't really don't care. It's not about, you know, they, they see all these best, you know, best in cancer, best in pediatrics, and best of the, all these different subjects, and, and it just turns out it's clutter to them. They really don't get it. They don't understand it. Um, there, there's a few small percent that feel better when they're out of place that, that shows that they're number one in something. Um, but it doesn't drive them to come to that place because of that. Yeah. That's interesting. I mean, I, you know why U.S. Uh, US News or, you know, in world, you know, all these reports put out these lists, right? To it's sell magazines. Yeah, it's all about selling yeah. magazines. <laughs> <laughs> you know, ironically, I, I helped host the HIT 99, but then, you know, I, don't, I wasn't trying to sell magazines. I was just trying to help the community come together. Uh, yeah. <laughs> to make sure it continued but uh, that was the complaint everyone told me you're just trying to get views it's like well that wasn't the goal and that's not the right. kind of I want really <laughs> you know but uh, it, it turns out you know that's the economics of it but that's interesting that they you know you're encouraging doximity in order to sway the ratings for your organization yeah it's not by my choice either uh, that's coming more from the C-suite. Uh, they like being number one in these different things. And they, um, as much as uh, we try to talk to them and from what the research actually shows that, you know, uh, but it's hard to convince them when, when our, com you know, way healthcare is going and it's just such a competitive, more competitive market that uh, the more their competitors are now boasting how they're number one in these different things. If we don't push the fact that we're number one in different things, we don't look at, you know, That's inviting. It's poor leadership. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> well, they're going to start it's insecurity. They're going to start weighing you on your number of Facebook likes and Twitter followers. And what's your What's your clout yeah. score? Yeah. What's yeah. your clout score depending on to, to determine the quality of care that you provide? Yeah. You know, you know, you know and this this conversation really leads to and leads back to I think a lot of the problems as I see it with meaningful use I think we're doing things backwards uh, and I think if uh, and we talked a little bit about this uh, last week is if we can get some type and 
some type of uh, application where we can get really current pertinent information that we can view with our patients at the same time. Right. Uh, say you get all that right there with the visit or before the visit, uh, the good things that occur with the discussion, the patient engagement uh, naturally flows downhill. And, and I think, unfortunately, I think sometimes we're trying to uh, push the, uh, uh, horse with the cart. I think we need to get the horse out front. And if we can really engage, I hate to use that term engage, but if we can, if we can involve our patients uh, in a different way, instead of uh, being a, you know, trying to uh, put all this information down in a computer while we're with our patient and not spending the quality time with our patient, then we're doing, I think everyone a disservice. So I think it's, it, it, then if you're able to do that, you know, to me, ratings are meaningless. It's really what happens at the encounter and what transpires. And the patient really has a choice in that matter. And if they decide not to do certain things you tell them, your ratings may come back uh, terribly, but you're doing what you should be doing. So I think ratings uh, don't necessarily reflect uh, the quality of care or the quality that you provide with the patient. It depends on, you know, patient mix, that sort of thing. I'm really talking off the top of my head here, but... uh, you know, but uh, stuff makes me um, angry. Uh, you know, I hate all those rating, the physician rating sites, the hospital rating sites, because here's the problem that I have with them. Uh, how does anyone know what kind of quality care that doctor's providing? The patients really don't know generally. Even a doctor going to another doctor, unless they're the same specialty, has almost no idea of how well that doctor's doing. And so what's the reality of all these physician rating sites? When they're rating the doctor, they're not rating them on what everyone really wants in a doctor, which is quality care, and they want to get better. You know, they want to be treated. They want to be healthy, right? We don't know how to rate that. What we know how to rate is customer service. Did they treat me nicely? Were they kind? Did they have good bedside manner? Was the front desk fast? Did I have to wait a long time? So, I mean, all of these portals are just customer service rating portals, but many of the patients are too, uh, I wanted to say stupid, but I could use the more uh, appropriate term of uh, uninformed. And they think rating must mean that they're a quality doctor. And so they, you know, they get that perception, even though the, the reality is, okay, it's really about customer service. Um, and many of them play into that, right? Uh, they, you know, they're making a lot of money off of those rating sites because of that misperception. Yep. Yeah, the majority of patients, they, they, they focus on their peers. You know, so as much as I, and I try to tell the, the C-suite the same thing, that we can pound our chest and saying how wonderful we are every day, but it doesn't mean anything um, as much as our peers are, our patients telling their peers how wonderful we are. So the more we can build that, that relationship between the patients and, and the actual physicians is the best way to do that. And live streaming has the ability to do that. Yeah. And let's be honest, uh, you know, good customer service and bedside manner matters as well. Right. I mean, <laughs> But I think if you gave anyone yeah. the option, would you rather go to a hospital or doctor who had bad bedside manner but got you better? Or would you rather go to the one that had good bedside manner and, you know, didn't treat your issue? We'd all take the person with bad bedside manner, right? <laughs> right. Or would you rather go to a hospital where a physician has a high ranking, but their sister went to a different physician and had glowing remarks to say about that physician and is very healthy and wonderful things. They're going to go to where their sister told them to go to regardless of what those high rankings are. Yeah. That's where the trust factor is. But you're right. I mean, I think, you know, reaching out through video can change your perspective on it. In fact, it can change it for good and bad. <laughs> if you do it the wrong it way, can, you're right. it can make you look like a, a cupcake organization that maybe you don't want to go to. So I guess you have to be careful. It's a double-edged sword. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Well, this is now, a- John. Quick question for you. I just tried tweeting out something, uh, so that should show up on the Twitter account. Is that right? Tell a little bird. So when you do that, does that tweet out on the Twitter stream? Is that how that works? Do you know? Yeah. If if you look at the left under the tell a little bird, those are all of those tweets that have gone out are using that tell a little bird. Oh, okay. I think, does it, oh, it, it's only you if you use that tell a little bird. Okay. I thought maybe it was searching Twitter for the uh, link and sucking in some other stuff. 
Because I just tweeted something out. Yeah, and I don't see it on my uh, Twitter feed. Did you, did you send it through? How did you send uh, it? Ah, uh, maybe I didn't hit the. Yeah, I might. Not, I'll try it again here. Sorry, yeah. sorry to interrupt, but I was just trying to figure that out. No, it looks like you do have to use the Tell a Little Bird. It would be nice if we could put a hashtag here and it would include anything that the Tell a Little Bird said and anything that include that hashtag, like almost like a little Twitter stream. So you could assign a hashtag to the blab and then see in real time what people are using on that hashtag. That would be pretty cool. Interesting. I'll have to send, it. send that suggestion. I'm tweeting into blab. <laughs> yeah. There you go. That worked. Did that work? Okay. Excellent. Yep. Sure. Oh, there we go. Well, I think, you know, it's going to be interesting uh, how, to see how all this evolves, but uh, still goes back to the core tenet of we all want education and uh, and we all want to connect and, and, and share with people. So uh, I, I think we're going to see more and more of that in healthcare. I'm interested to see what, you know, so I, I, was it Chuck that said, uh, he wrote the post that said something about imagine if Periscope was used with the patient. Uh, and, yes, he did write that. And someone uh, said that on the screen up here. I don't know who. There was something about how docs, you know, let me see if I can find it, how if they all could get together. Yeah. Wouldn't it, Coco Inter Nomad said earlier, wouldn't it be cool if specialists all over the world could collaborate on complicated cases without naming the patient to get a really specialized knowledge? That's what Chuck was saying, in essence, when he had that flat tire, right? And he did, uh, when he started using Periscope, how he could brainstorm and some guy in the UK helped him get his tire off. He couldn't figure out how to do it. Um, but I think those are similar threads of thought. I think. You could also imagine each of these as a care team, right? You know, you, you've got your care team, you know, especially for a complex uh, situation, if you have a, you know, a chronic disease and you have multiple specialties or multiple hospitals working on your issue, you could have them all in here in this nice format to be able to share what's happening with the care team. Uh, I think we do some of that already through, uh, what's that main uh, telemedicine one that's super expensive? Uh, I just forgot the name of it. Uh, it's mostly a phone company, phone conferencing. Anyway, but uh, this is all. VoIP, is it VoIP or something like that? Or I just forgot the name of it. It's the most common one. It's really expensive. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, I mean, of course, there's lots of HIPAA questions, right? Because uh, mm -hmm. this is not HIPAA compliant. <laughs> Gotta love HIPAA. Yeah, yeah, HIPAA would uh, love us if we did that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, 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 <laughs> you walk that fine line. You, you, just because you don't use the patient's name, if if that patient happens to be watching and can 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 get enough of those clues to go, hey, that's me, then that's yeah. a HIPAA violation, and yeah. and it's just ridiculous. So. And, and that's probably why no patient care will ever happen on these things. They're patient discussions. If you could do um, it in private somehow in a secure fashion, then I, I could see that being very helpful. Um, yeah. If you, you could somehow comply with the HIPAA um, for regulation. <laughs> yeah. If you could turn off the public um, front facing part of blab and just have a private blab, then sure. Nigeru says try appear.in. I yep, I've seen that. Um, appear, I, I've used appear.in and the quality is not very good. Will they sign a business associate agreement? You know, I mean, they, they start getting into that. It's like, well, they should, right? Because they're probably storing it on their server. I've heard uh, some video conferencing ones say, well, we're not storing anything. We're just a transport thing. You have your telecom provider sign a business associate agreement, you know, and so that, that's where all those HIPAA discussions go, right? Um, Linda Winslow yeah. actually chimed in with a patient, right? She works with a 16-month-old with uh, Nager syndrome. I don't know if I pronounced that right. Only approximately 250 cases reported worldwide. Uh, it's an interesting opportunity to get that out there, right? Um, mm -hmm. the, the best example I heard with that is actually in the EHR vendor. Uh, you know, modernizing medicine has what they call their grand rounds application. So when you, uh, you know, when you diagnose someone with Nager syndrome, you can then look across every provider on that EHR and see what other providers did. Uh, and since they own something like 20% of the dermatology uh, marketplace, it's pretty powerful because, you know, maybe if there's 250 cases worldwide, if they have 20% of the market share, well, 
that's 20, what is that, 45, uh, something like that. Uh, 45 cases that they would have in their system on average, uh, which would help you give some insight into what's happening. They don't actually share the specific patient, but they do it across all of them. You know, mo you know these many did this you know, drug or this uh, procedure or whatever uh, based on the diagnosis. So, you know, I think that there's platforms being built around that. The problem is modernizing medicine has a unique situation where they essentially standardize the documentation across every provider. So they can actually do that type of longitudinal study across providers based on diagnosis, whereas every other EHR vendor has these templates that, you know, good luck getting the data out. <laughs> So, but the internet is a great way to uh, get people to uh, collaborate. Yeah. I saw, I think now I what created, I created one with a, a pediatric one. Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, oh, you know, sorry. With a pediatric one out of Boston, they created a platform because their question was they're finding all these interesting things, but how do they share it with the world? So I, I know IBM was working on some product to be able to do that as well. Well, it's, it's easy. You, you spend three months writing an article, you submit it to a journal, you, you wait another three months for it to be peer reviewed, and then it gets printed and, and put in the recycle bin. <laughs> and it gets shared with the world. Oh, oh and if, if you don't have the article and you want to go find it online, then you have to pay $50 for that article. Just a quick question about Blab. These these icons up top here on on top of our where our four videos are. There's a, a row of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So is that in order of how we joined here? It looks like uh, as we opened up the Blab, uh, it looks like John, you're first, I'm second, Chuck's third, and then a uh, Sheila Strover. Uh, Knee Guru is uh, next, and then we've got Ryan. So that must be the order in which everyone joined the Blab. Is that how that works? You know? Yeah. I have fine. no idea. It's okay. not that same order for me. Okay. Yeah, mine is. But, uh... And then the 30 and 14. 14 are actual viewers, and 30 are total viewers during the whole time. Is that is that what that – the 30, 14? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 5 and 30 was how many total? Okay. Yeah. Are you all on the uh, desktop version? Yep. I yes. Yep. I'm on my iPad right now. I'm on a Chromebook. The dual monitors. Is yeah. Like so, so look at Michael's video. His video is much cleaner than everybody else's, and he's he's using the app. Ah, yes. Yeah, he's a little, I, I see that now that you point that out. Yeah, he's definitely sharper than John. Yeah. No I didn't say he was prettier. <laughs> I just said the picture's clear. Like I'm trying sharper to image, sharper image. <laughs> hair growth department. Yeah, yeah. You know, we kind of have a, you know, we have no hair. We have just a little bit of hair. We got a little <laughs> and the long hair. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Well, I, I have a feeling we could uh, hang out here forever, uh, but uh, I guess this is the start of the new Blab adventure. <laughs> yeah, I definitely well, see a lot yeah. of opportunities. Yeah, I do too. I and I appreciate you inviting me, John. This is a lot of fun, and uh, and um, um, just really appreciate you having me on. So, and nice meeting you, Ryan, and nice meeting you, yeah. Mike. Yeah, same here, James. Thank same. you. I'm glad you didn't have patience. And uh, I mean, to me, I'll, I will admit uh, somewhat the, some of this is a bit selfish on my part because uh, I actually submitted to HIMSS to do a presentation on uh, the latest technologies like Periscope, Meerkat, uh, you know, Google Hangouts, et cetera, et cetera, how they can be used in healthcare. So to me, exploring Blabs and seeing how that's doing could, you know, assuming we get accepted, we'll see, you know, the HIMSS process. You have to submit something. Uh, what is it? And nine, 10 months before the conference, it's going to be innovative in nine, 10 months, which it feels like the, the research journal. These process. won't be here by then. <laughs> but I think we can. No, I think this has a, I think this will be, I think this has a real potential. I really do. I think it does have a. But we kept our submission generic enough that we can include things like Blab that didn't even exist when we submitted our <laughs> proposal. That's funny. It's you know, good. They accepted, uh, but then also the HIT, uh, HITC marketing conference. So 
I do healthitmarketingconference.com is my conference. And, you know, we have, we're growing into the hospital space as well and how do hospitals market. So I'm glad, Michael, you joined because I, I need more of that perspective. Uh, we mostly did it. How do we market to doctors and hospitals? But now we're doing how do you market to patients and build that trust? I mean, there's certainly some overlap when it comes to content marketing, social media marketing. Uh, but definitely appreciate your insights. I'm, I'm interested to learn more about, you know, the hospital side, the B2C, if you will, uh, All right. as well. Lab's powerful. Yeah, we're like I said, have you, any of you guys use a meerkat? I have not. No. I've watched yeah, That's it. getting very popular. I've used yeah. it. I used it a couple of times at our hospital. Um, where we did a couple of things. We have a lot of things scheduled right now from uh, interviewing some of our uh, cancer physicians or cancer surgeons. Um, we have uh, we have a level one trauma center, so we interview some of those, and we're going to interview the helicopter pilots and the medics. They show mm. them around, give tours, and answer questions from the public. Uh, our simulation lab for the teaching part of our hospital. So we have a lot of things planned, and we plan to use that. And uh, I think there's some opportunities with the lab where Meerkat is very good one to one, and you get very good engagement. Um, from multiple people, but allowing individuals to kind of jump in on camera and do some questions. Again, if we can get around the HIPAA thing, but uh, I think there's some great opportunities. So, John, if you have any questions, I can be glad to share. And, and share yeah, I'd love to hear it. Done. If you can uh, tweet me when you do some of this stuff, I'd love to see, you know, some of what you're creating. Uh, that's great. I know yeah. Jimmy, I think it was you that interviewed the patient, right? Or I Yeah, think- I did. I, I interviewed, we had her sign the form and do everything by the book. And she's very, what, what was so unique about her situation was that uh, she's not only a patient of mine, but uh, a nurse. And she also uh, ran a very busy uh, physician office in her past. So I was able to get some uh, really great insight on how she views what I'm doing in the office with some simple little tools that I've been able to uh, mm-hmm. uh, work out. And that was just, a, a, I think, a good use of Periscope. And then John and Chuck and uh, actually David uh, Grayson, a uh, guy from New Zealand, he's the one, he's a doc, he's an ENT doc from New Zealand, all the way from, uh, ah, I, uh, I can't remember, I don't remember the city, but he actually asked me on a tweet if I would interview a patient. And I really didn't want to parade a bunch of patients out in public, but I, he gave me the courage to ask this one patient. I thought it went over quite well. Um, so I thought she was able to convey some really good insight on, on some things. So um, I see that type of thing in social media. If you can uh, get uh, folks to comment uh, who otherwise it would be difficult to um, get those kinds of uh, sentiments and uh, thoughts out there in the public forum. And that worked quite well in a Periscope fashion. And the questions, I was able to ask her questions in real time from people from all over the world. And uh, this type of forum might have worked a little bit better, but it, it worked. And I think uh, then I was able to save that to YouTube. So. So it's, it's, what's nice about Periscope is, you know, I'm, I'm basically a computer phobe. That's why I like my phone book. It's dummy proof. Uh, that's what I like about Periscope. It's easy to do, and then it's easy to save to a YouTube. And I think Blab has the same simplicity, you know, for computer phobe docs like me. Um, I think it's something that easy to easy to start up. I mean, John just had me going here in just a matter of a few seconds. We had, what, three or four attempts, but then we were in. So it worked quite easy. Uh-huh. That was all user error on my part getting it started. So <laughs> there was also an issue. The first tell a little bird sent an undefined link. In fact, it did it both times for me. I don't know why, but uh, after the first time, it sent the proper link. So yeah, good old uh, things. Uh, it's interesting the discussion. Julie Moss asks, "Can you do you know your screen sharing capability?" And uh, Niguru says that you're not a lot you know not integrated, but you can something like Minicam. To do it, yeah, or, that's easy. <laughs> you can move your camera, right? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Uh, use your webcam with multiple programs at once. Add graphics to your webcam video. That's what Minicam does. That's interesting. Of course, it's still early days for this, and I, you know, I think the other good part about Blab is it's going to push Google Hangout to do a lot more with what they're doing, because if they don't, they'll just get left behind. Uh, I won't be surprised if we have the tile layout coming to Google Hangouts very soon. And we have the applause button coming to Hangouts. Oh, yeah. You can thank Paris. Is Linda, 
Is Linda Winslow still on? I see her chatting. Is Linda Winslow still on here? If she is, you wouldn't mind chatting in there. It's actually, that's where I'm working, where you're talking. Yes. Hello, Linda. How are you? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you guys, but I saw her. She's, uh, she was talking about Hershey Medical, uh, and that's actually the hospital I work at. I saw her talking in there. Yeah. I did a rotation at York Hospital back when I was a right. medical student. Uh, as third and fourth year medical students, we were able to do rotations. And I went up to Hershey one day to go to, to the chocolate factory, and it was closed. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, since I don't know how long ago that was, they built a chocolate world. Uh, Is that right? No, this was back in 88, 89, I think. So it's been a few years. Yeah. 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 Everywhere now. There's Hershey's Chocolate World here in uh, Vegas. We saw one in Dubai. We actually took a picture. <laughs> it's all over. All right. He's in South Carolina now. Yeah, it's interesting. I interviewed at a hospital system in South Carolina. Small medical world that we live in, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really is. It really is. And there was this conference. I don't know, John, if you saw the Mayo in Oz conference down in Brisbane, Australia. Uh -huh. Well, what, what was just fascinating, um, I've met a gal on Twitter that lives near Boston, Massachusetts, and she knew one of the presenters. Uh, uh, and we were all, you know, I, I, I tweeted with this uh, uh, guy from Australia turned out she had worked with him on a, you know, knew him. So three folks from all over the, we had similar connections and uh, it really is. It's, it's an interesting, the black, the uh, playground is certainly smaller with a lot of this so, social media and a lot of the technology. It, it really is uh, going to be interesting to see what the next several years, uh, uh, how it will all play out. And it really is a lot of fun. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. And we're not even talking about like, the real health and wellness side of things, right? Uh, I mean, you know, we've talked about just kind of traditional healthcare now through this and some education and stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you think about it from a wellness perspective and actually keeping people healthy or what I call treating healthy patients, uh, I think there's going to be huge opportunities for that. The, the key question I think most doctors ask about that is, okay, that's fine. I'm happy to do that. They would love to do that. They're like, how am I going to get paid? <laughs> yeah what's what's the icd-9 for that or 10 yeah, ICD ten. get ready <laughs> yeah I now, you better be <laughs> it's changing yeah. healthcare is changing uh, what's the blab icd-10 code <laughs> Sixty-five thousand of them there should be there should be a blab it's, it's, uh, maybe that's what they meant uh, you know skis on fire uh while you're blabbing <laughs> Crazy. One of my one of my favorite metrics when we talk about it in our research is they say on on average only eleven percent of of uh, consumers are actually actively seeking out healthcare at any given time. So that's eighty nine percent of the consumers who aren't even don't even care about healthcare until they're sick. So how do you reach those people? And that's where uh, you know this this whole wellness thing comes in. Yep. Keeping and them healthy. Value-based reimbursement will push that where you actually get paid to treat them to be healthy. I, I've thought about going into my doctor's office and just saying I'm healthy and see what they do. Why are you here? What's your yeah. Nothing. I just uh, wanted to let you know I'm good. <laughs> you know, the thing is, I you know, like I want, I'm healthy and I want to stay healthy, and I'm pretty sure I know what their response is going to be, which is why I haven't done it is I'm pretty sure what they'll do is they'll just give me like a full physical exam and then they won't find anything. They'll say, you're good. Enjoy. Maybe yeah. they'll give me some little diet. You should eat right and you should exercise, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. They're not so really going to look and say, you're 30% likely to get diabetes and you're 45% you know, likely to get cholesterol. So let's focus on some things that will help you do this to improve your, you know, your risk for diabetes and <laughs> things like that. Yeah. Do you, do you know uh, Zubin Damania out in Vegas? He's my doctor. What he's doing? <laughs> what he's doing with Turntable Health? Yeah, I actually am a Turntable Health member. So. <laughs> Are you? There you go. Yeah. So that that's uh, I mean that's exactly what that is set up to do. So why are you scared to go in? Well, no, I mean, I think they would take a little different approach. I was going to go to the regular doctor because I think it would be an interesting yeah. story. But what's yeah. interesting, that, you know, so my experience with that, right, is I went in just saying, let's see what they do rather than trying to push the envelope. And mm -hmm. we'll see, actually, the insurance. I got insurance, which included turns health. 
and it turns out at the end of the year that insurance company is gone. So I, I, we'll see how long I remember more. But uh, anyway, so I I, uh, I wanted to see the experience, what it was like. And there's still very much an old school doctor's office. It feels very similar. They spent more time and they wanted to create more of a relationship. But it still felt, you know, like they were trying to learn how to do the new model as well. So, you know, I mean, I think that was my insight from being a patient there. And my wife went and she's been, you know, is that they, they care more and they're more proactive. And these are all huge steps forward. Uh, you know, I called in one day on a Saturday and I said, hey, I'm having this issue. And they said, okay, we'll do this, do this. And if you, if it still continues, go to the, you know, to the uh, uh, quick care. I said, all right, great. Well, on Monday, I got an email from my care coordinator saying, hey, how'd things go this weekend? But, you know, what other doctor's office does that? <laughs> I do. I do. Yeah. <laughs> the portal, the patient portal is fantastic. And if you can integrate that in with your electronic record, well, the health CRM patient portal. But I think I think you're hitting the nail on the head, John. Um, I think you there to me, the whole idea of a, a paper chart, the uh, old time, 15 minute, half an hour visit. It's all concrete, hard, solid in your thinking. And what you're describing is now we live in a time in which all this is fluid. So the electronic record flows between my patient's uh, 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 iPad that they use at home, my nurse's dual monitor desktop, my desktop, my Chromebook. It's all fluid. It's not static. And we have to also think the same way, in my opinion, with the uh, office visit. It's no longer a fixed time, 15 minutes. It actually starts maybe two or three weeks before the visit when you have your lab work drawn or whatever. And that all that information gets sent to you on your portal. You come and see the doc face to FaceTime, uh, do a summary right away. Uh, you can visit with your wife or whatever two or three weeks later. So that office visit now is over a continuum of time instead of a fixed uh, place in an office. So I think until you start to think that way, um, you can really then integrate some things that can be a lot of fun and actually uh, cater to the patient's needs. And, and I think everyone benefits. I think the patient uh, will ultimately benefit as well as the nurse and the doc. I think that's where we're headed. And I think that's where, and I, and I congratulate your doc for doing that because I think that's a fantastic approach. If that makes sense, hopefully that's not too uh, that's good. Crazy. I mean, uh, yeah. You know, I wrote an article that said, where's the real-time platform that allows, and I did it from the doctor's perspective, a doctor to get online and see some patients anytime they want, right? Uh, you know, which, I, you know, you could do it from the patient's perspective as well that said, I'm a patient, I want to see a doctor, why can't I just go to a platform and then they provide me a doctor that sees me and I can, you know, be seen quickly, uh, and if we created that, you know, I argued that for the doctors, it might actually be a real benefit. Because I think many doctors are afraid of this saying, oh, you're going to take away my office visits. Well, right now in the doctor's office, we do all sorts of scheduling nightmares, like double booking appointments and doing 15 minutes versus 30 minutes. And, and then we, you know, what happens when they don't show now, you know, I mean, that's why they do all these double booking scenarios so that you can have a day of 15 patients well some days you end up seeing 20 because they all show and some days you you know you, you hit 15 but you know you're often not working right well imagine now instead of doing no shows uh when someone doesn't show up i mean you still have the choice if someone doesn't show up you can take a break right <laughs> if revenue yeah and i think tell i agree i think telemedicine has its place i really do yeah, and I for me I, I, I wouldn't want to start telling well, what instead said going doing nothing, you went to the platform and said, okay, I'm going to fill my no-show because I want to make my money and just go on telemedicine. That's powerful. Sorry to interrupt, Jimmy. <laughs> no, no, I, I thought you were done. I, it's, there's a little bit of a lag, and I apologize. I thought you were done, and I'm still getting used to this, so I jumped right in. Um, just, a head, just a little bit of a lag, and I apologize. But the way I see, and I'd like to integrate telemedicine sometime in the next – maybe six to 12 months. I, you know, I'm in a rural state and not a lot of folks in this state, only about a million. And we're, we're the fourth largest state. So, you know, if we've got a snowstorm in the middle of January and I've got an established patient that needs to be seen and they can't come down here, I think telemedicine will work wonderfully. Uh, the problem is, you know, you got to have the, uh, 
you got to have the bandwidth and you got to have the bandwidth on their end. Problem with Montana, a lot of folks may not be able to have that option because they just don't have the ability to do video uh, in a way. So uh, that's something that I'll have to tease out and, and work on over time in terms of how how much of a reality can that really be in the next several years because of the infrastructure here in Montana. And are you going to get paid for that? <laughs> uh, I, that's the other issue is, yeah, a reimbursement and all that. Those are things I'm going to have to look at. But I think Montana would be an ideal state for telemedicine for a doc like me. It wouldn't be taking new patients off the street, but my established, complex, difficult patients that had a difficult time getting in to see me, I think would work wonderfully well. I really do. Yep. And there's so many situations like that, uh, whether it's the rural environment and there is no expertise or you already have an existing relationship. I remember uh, the doctor from Kansas who's in a small town. And she's like, I don't have patients. She said, I have neighbors and friends that come and see me. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, yeah, my relationship with them and how I treat them and what we share and what we know is very different. You know, when you go back to records retention, she's like, of course, I want to keep the records of my friends. You know, 30 years from now, they're still going to be my friends and they're going to be my neighbors and I better treat them appropriately and know their history. So I think it's a different world, right? So, oh, yeah. I, I guess I better get back to the work of the day. I don't know what you guys have, but <laughs> I love it. An impromptu blab. Uh, who knows even how long? I mean, this, you know, we didn't even set a clock on it. It would be interesting to see how long it's been. But thanks been going a while. Yeah, exactly. But I'm sure we'll do it again. And uh, thanks to uh, James, Ryan, and Michael for joining me. And even Chuck, I, he got in a little bit at the beginning. So uh, thanks, and uh, we'll definitely do it again. Hey, thanks, thanks again, John. We'll Thank you, you John. All right. Nice, nice meeting you, Ryan and Mike. Nice meeting you. Yeah, nice meeting you guys. You on social media. <laughs> now, how do we get out of here? Just click the X? <laughs> <laughs>